Okay, so I've I've made a lot of recordings criticizing Sam Vaknin for moral positions that he has taken. And I have even denoted in earlier recordings of this variety of making the same kind of broad complaint or th that there's a recurring pattern here. And I think now my work with Metagram has, um, I'm going to have to carefully sort of release all the recordings that I have because I've got like six hours, no, or in, no, actually closer to like now eight hours, although in separate, in separate um, bundles, um, where I finally get into integrating Metagram and Metatype, and I think it's going quite nicely, and I think actually I have a very good model or rubric for understanding sort of cluster B type psychopathology um, and also the kind of the interrelatedness between it, um, between all the different, you know, sort of personality disorders within, um, within the cluster B uh, pantheon. And um, anyway, so, so I, and so, so, I mean, this is going to be uh, in the context of that. I mean, this commentary is going to be sort of not a kind of standalone. But I'll just, uh, okay, this is going to sound very unfair, but um, someone showed me um, the title of Sam Vaknin's video and gave me a small summary of his argument. And I feel like I actually don't need to watch the video because the, the argument is quite, I think, correctly summarized. Although obviously I, I can't know that 100% sure, but I, but I trust the, the person who summarized it for me. And I think that um, uh, it is, this is just such a familiar thing. So anyway, all, all those caveats being said, um, uh, the title of Sam Buckman's video is uh, Vaccine Defiance is Psychopathic and Narcissistic. To refuse to get, and the subtitle is, uh, or the description of the video is, to refuse to get vaccinated in the view of cumulative data is defiant, contumacious, and reckless. In short, it is psychopathic and grandiose. Uh, I chose to get va vaccinated having engaged in in obligations, rights, utilitarian calculus, vaccines, reduce infections, obligation to protect others. Uh, sorry, like avoiding DUI. Is that... I'm not actually sure what DUI is. That sort of like drunk driving or something. Um, uh, vaccines reduce hospital hospital hospitalization rates and so that obviously goes into you know the idea of um, medical resources that are shared in in a at least in a public health system and or at least by a community only has so much capacity um, so um, yeah so the the Utilitarian argument. Okay, so I, I mean, I think that there are good utilitarian grounds to debunk the narrative that is being spun. And I think because I think that the narrative that is being spun is largely, it's not, you know, like a mountain of cherry picked data where you haven't even looked to falsify your own position is not very credible. And especially with how the discussion around COVID has been suppressed. Um, you know, I, I do think that we have to, quite frankly, give some credence uh, to some conspiracy theories and, 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 to, and to think about their possible, um, you know, s s sort of truth in them. And I mean, uh, I know that that might sound like a crazy sort of thing, but just abstractly taking some of these shreds of conspiracy that have which I have heard spoken from the mouths of real doctors, of people with real degrees and real expertise. So I will consider those things, especially under the kinds of authoritarian slash fascistic uh, 
you know, way in which um, public health is often uh, lied about, where the truth is, is you know, sort of oversimplified. Um, and essentially you get these very harsh prescriptive, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, bad reality checks. You know, you, you, you get this very contrived reality tunnel that is fashioned out of, well, because it would be slightly better for everyone. And even that rationale, I think, I mean, this has been, quite frankly, health in general is not such a good science. It, I mean, I'll agree that it is some kind of science, but if you understand the philosoph or the intellectual rigor that's gone into it, it's very badly constructed. We can see this very clearly when we look at dietary science, because it's based on general, it's based on generalizations. There's no, oh, well, you have this profile, therefore you have to have that kind of diet. It's all generalized to the whole population. It's utterly insane. It's contemptible. And then, so if you're going to reduce science into one size fits all, into a lowest common denominator, you get, so you get something that's quite distorted because you won't even allow for the for the basic rethinking of the premise of the assumption that, you know, th th that that it's more complicated than a one size fits all. Now, the 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 shreds of conspiracy theory that I talked to the 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 that. that when I say that I talk to, I, I mean that, that I'm referring to, uh, um, that I'm going to trot out now, um, which I guess I, I have to say these are unproven, but I think that just on the level of, of abstract reason, we can even vet, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, I, 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 I think that it's possible to exclude some things as being completely outlandish or seeing how when we put this in in the perspective of what we know that we don't know about medical science, because we know very little about immune structure. We know very little, and there are lots of types of immunity that we don't actually understand in medical science. So having that kind of humility and then taking that into account with, uh, you know, making public policy, I think is, is a very important sort of thing to do. Now, all the, and, and, and let me just say that, when we also know what we don't know, and we also take the realm of possibility, let's just say vi quite viable possibility of what could really be going on and things like that. And then we look at these prescriptions and, and we look at these edicts and we look at these policies, then we can also see how unreasonable they are being as well. And that's a completely different calculation. So I think that there are all these streams of calculation. The one is perhaps you could say has a methodology that is far too broad to sort of listen to conspiracy theorists that, 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 that have, you know, that have medical degrees because there are, there are lots of, you know, sort of uh, 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 gung-ho, you know, sort of radical charlatans that, that uh, uh, have loud mouths all over the place. So you can't just listen to anyone. But I think that the reason why you do have experts and professionals and people with real credentials behind their name saying such variable and wild things is because we are dealing in a context which is actually we don't the science is not settled as it were it does not get settled because you because of a balance of probability that's not how you make prescriptions in in medicine as well it's not on a balance of probability oh you've got one more shred of data on your side no that's not, that's not how you should make public policy. That's immoral. Okay, and, and I think that when we start looking at this in a, in a principled way, in a moral way, and in a slightly, therefore, abstract calculus, we can actually see what's, what's likely going on here, which is that the drive towards vaccines is really a kind of preemptive, defensive, double-down play, because the the vaccines are not going to have their intended public health consequence. They're not going to have how they were sold to the public is not going to pan out and they need a scapegoat. And, and I can just generalize this into this principle is that any, any public policy that has as its premise that the idea is, is that we are going to eradicate COVID if, if the idea is somehow associated, is somehow uh, 
interrelated with 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 the idea that you know that this plan is going to or should eventuate in the eradication of COVID, it's unrealistic, it's unreasonable, and it's incoherent. But because that has been the the policy gaslighting narrative, because that's been sort of the, the unspoken premise of all of this public policy, they are preemptively setting themselves up for a scapegoat to divert the blame of, of the, the structural or systemic pressure of just, well, this is the reality of life itself. This is the cost benefit analysis that one has to do when one looks at policy and things like that. And so, I mean, I think in the long term, what will eventually happen is that we will have a variant, a mutation of the virus that the vaccine will not capture. And at that point, they will need to scapegoat the blame. And this is in anticipation of that, which I think is quite stupid, because unless you're going to eradicate the virus 100% all over the world, it's vanity. It's absolute vanity. It's irrelevant. Because whether we get a, a COVID strain that is resilient uh, or, or, or is, not, is not covered by, by the vaccine, wherever it comes from, it doesn't matter. And the idea that eradication of the virus was ever on the table is absolute lunacy, even for the Australians. The, the Australians have, uh, you know, they, they did succeed in eradicating the virus in their borders. Wonderful for them. So now that means that either the rest of the world eradicates the virus or we continue as a species separated between Australia and the rest of the world. You become the mole men in, um, uh, there was a movie that was based on Jules Verne, you know, sort of time travel. Um, and then they go into the future and there's, you know, sort of this other side of the human species that, 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 that operates, you know, uh, deep beneath the ground and they, they look completely, you know, that's what Australia was doing when they were eradicating the virus. But that was short lived anyway, because now I'm going to essentially say a conspiracy theory um, is that uh, uh, it's a well known phenomenon that when someone gets vaccinated, they can pass on the virus to non-vaccinated people around them. And so I would say uh, uh, this is known about vaccines. So as soon as they started vaccinating in Australia, you were going to get some kind of outbreak of COVID. And I believe that they invented the story around how COVID was infiltrated around the airport. Suddenly, Australia had eradicated the virus, suddenly they start vaccinating people, and suddenly you start getting outbreaks of COVID. I don't think this is a coincidence, and I don't, and I don't believe the story that it all came from the airports. That's all I have to say about that pipe dream of eradication. Now, now we are seeing this, the inexactitude in the narrative in the promulgated, you know, kind of lowest common denominator um, sort of story about how this plot is supposed to play itself out and, and the logic of the public policy. And the structural problems with this narrative are going to get scapegoated onto the people who, quite frankly, don't want to be a medical experiment. Now, that isn't even a conspiracy theory. This virus has not gone through the same process of approval. It's got an emergency approval. It's not properly, the long-term effects are, are not known. And, and I'll, I'll conjecture my own conspiracy theory. And I think that I'm intelligent enough to do that. But obviously, this is my opinion. And I, I perhaps have a, a higher estimation of my own opinion and my own opinion. So anybody else can take it with a grain of salt. I'm exercising my freedom of speech is um, I believe that the kind of protection that the vaccine confers is probably definitely worth it 
for people who are high risk or vulnerable. But I believe that um, the kind of resilience or protection or immunity that it provides might be a problem for future viruses that have mutated. That this might entrain the immune system into fighting this kind of virus in a particular kind of way that might in the future be ineffectual. That's my conspiracy theory. And I think that that might also be anticipated by these people who are now pushing for some kind of idea that, that the idea is eradication. That they've sort of converted the whole system into an all or nothing kind of proposition through use of their irresponsible blanket narrative where they have systematized the blame and then they have confected it towards their, their scapegoat. So um, I, I, I do think that this is a kind of ideological preemptive strike to mop up their own sloppy, unrealistic and unreasonable policy, which was never properly substantiated in the first place. We never had the right kinds of debates about these measures. You know, we, we, we wanted the lock. I think that also perhaps, it, I mean, without going that far, without going that far as to that this is a conspiracy that actually will um, endanger the long-term health of people, but it already has endangered the long-term health in people if you calculate the costs of lockdown. And if you calculate the costs of lockdown, which we never had a proper discourse about, we never had a proper debate over, you know, it was always just to flatten the curve and then it never ended. Because that's how ineffectual the, the substantiation for the policy of lockdown was. That's how weak it was. That's how untrue it was. It was unrealistic and unreasonable. And so we, we were doing it for the wrong headline, you know, um, and then we got trapped into having to double down into perpetuating it. And then we never do the real cost uh, benefit analysis. Is this worth the health, the mental health of our children? Is this worth the developmental and educational, you know, so, sort of uh, um, costs to society? You know, society isn't just vulnerable old people who could have also perhaps still had a, a lockdown for them that didn't affect other people while everybody else cultivated herd immunity. So we could have segregated the vulnerable. We could have quarantined the high risk. Instead, we did it to everyone. You know, so, so the whole kind of... That's what happens when the truth, when the rationale gets dumbed down by the kind of lowest common denominator simplification of the narrative. And, and I have a feeling the same thing is happening now, although we don't know what their real calculus is. I mean, it might very well be that if, if uh, the virus does jump from someone who is vaccinated, because yes, you're less likely but, uh, to, to, to transmit the virus when you are vaccinated, but that doesn't mean that you don't. It just means less. Less is not negatory, is not nothing. So when it does happen in rare cases, then perhaps also you're going to get you're going to get a variant of the virus in the other person incubated there. And if that person wasn't themselves vaccinated, then you've got maybe a kind of an opportunity for a mutation against the variant that the vaccine itself even um you know, I mean, I mean, to override this risk, perhaps they should say, well, if you have the vaccine, you should self-quarantine. And then after your self-quarantine vaccine, you know, kind of, I mean, obviously that, that would, that would never fly because then, you know, the vac the jab would be a, uh, um, it would be an obvious impediment. It would be an obvious, you know, sort of detriment because, you know, if you had to sort of self-quarantine after taking the jab, for you know how many months until it kind of sort of sets in you know it, it's uh it it would be ludicrous and so instead you have to shunt the you have to shunt the blame onto the unvaccinated so you know there's a lot of 
horse trading. And this is the same kind of horse trading that you get in identity politics and the systematization of blame and, and then scapegoating it on, on convenient targets. That all of, is based on, well, if you accept the fundamental premise, which is actually false, which is that it's capable of being eradicated. And it's capable of being eradicated by these dishonest means, by these distorted and twisted, you know, at the cost of honesty, at the cost of freedom of speech, at the cost of, you know, a liberal democratic society. Um, that they can manage it better according to these plans that involve this amount of dishonesty and tailoring of the narrative. So I, I, I do think that this whole thing is a, is a, is a low-scale version of, of, um, of the cerebral histrionic. This is how cerebral histrionics um, design thought control and, and manipulation. And it's interesting because I think that the cerebral histrionic actually prides themselves on creating a kind of sort of ideological conflagration kind of ideological um, uh, intransigence that, that cannot be denied and it cannot be neatly unpacked or, or folded down. You know, so it's kind of like, I think the cerebral histrionic almost prides itself in creating a narrative that can absorb cognitive dissonance that can sustain and absorb the the strain and the stresses of cognitive dissonance. And I think this is how it's a kind of that you get the kind of the, the dynamic of narcissists and cerebral histrionics and borderlines colluding with each other, essentially. And I also wanted to elaborate on on an aspect here is that um you know I I I talked about um also a kind of ver variant of the culture wars in parallel to psychology. And I talked about how essentially the borderline can be seen as a kind of heiress figure and, and how it has to kind of conjoin itself, how it's only interested in having a relationship, this in the context of almost like a sexual relationship or a romantic type relationship with another type heiress figure. And so I think that and I also tried to explain how both narcissists and cerebral histrionics are in a kind of cohort. They're in a natural alignment because they all have the same kind of heiress model. They're all using the same kind of Oedipal mother, objective narrative, environmental, external locus of control that is being invoked is that this this field circuit in psychology is being, um, you have to accept the label to enter into how that field circuit operates. You have to accept an objective semantic reduction in order to be counted, in order to be sorted, um, because there's only one orthodoxy. There's only one, um, and that sort of solipsistic, Thing is is essentially archetypally a kind of eros um, thing and then for you to relate to it on the outside you have to have let's say an appetite or an appreciation of that eros functionality that it has disassociated itself from the other field circuits so the other field circuits can be personal psychologically but this field circuit this particular field circuit is colluded as being a kind of um, solipsism that has a relationship to your model of Eris, your model of the Oedipal mother. Which has taken on an environmental, you know, uh, sort of set of, of identities and roles and narrative that can be tracked. Anyway, um, 
uh, man, that's a bit of a disjointed thing to, to emphasize and bring up because that comes from another recording. I just wanted to add that on there. But uh, I guess it's elaborated in what I'm about to say is that I, I in the same way that I, descri that I described that the borderline has as its secondary fiddle, as, as, a, as its second fiddle, as its, you know, is, is called the secondary psychopath, and, and, you know, I, I don't think that this is an original thinking from my part, but essentially that the borderline is as a, as a secondary tactic, as a defense maneuver, as a pincer maneuver, as a strategic deployment of corralling people towards its borderline control of the narrative of a particular field circuit, it's going to use its subconscious stimulus emotional tone which is in going to be in, in, in another field circuit it's going to sometimes jump into that valence and then be a narcissist in order to so chaos or disrupt or corral people back towards the borderline strategy back towards the borderline tactic so it's a second it's a like a pincer movement and i think the same way is for narcissists and cerebral histrionics. I think that the narcissist is a secondary cerebral histrionic. And the cerebral histrionic, as I've already described, almost prides itself on being able to construct almost a kind of a, a common core conservative narrative that can absorb the strain of cognitive dissonance because the narcissist needs a secondary strategy to prop up its field of narcissistic supply to prop up the Oedipal, the environmental field of, of aggregating narcissistic supply, which they need to terrorize or they need to lord over. They need to be able to receive admittance to a, 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 um, a preserved field that can supply them with um, narcissistic supply. And so half the time, or I mean, metaphorically, not really half the time, maybe less than half the time, ideally, they will pump up their own Oedipal mother, but they can't do so as a narcissist. They have to do so as a kind of, as a secondary aspect. So they have a kind of secondary mode that they fall into. And I think that that secondary mode could essentially be the, the, the so I mean, I see them as that there are three distinct roles here. You have, and the borderline in the cerebral histrionic, I think, can also be a particular individual that has both of these strategies, both of these tendencies. Although I think that that would, that would be the kinds of borderlines that are capable of self-soothing, as it were, that they're, they're capable of they they have less identity dysregulation because they actually the cerebral histrionic gives them the, the the secondary fiddle of of the cerebral histrionic as opposed to the narcissist gives them a um a tactical measures and and strategic resources which fill in the gaps that the narcissistic second fiddle for the borderline um, sort of uses as as tinder and as sort of its uh, um, ammunition to sort of force people to deal with their borderline stuff. So look, I, look, I've I've stated this very ineloquently, but um, th that that that's that's. And, and, you know, I've, I go into those mechanisms in my sort of six hour or no, probably in the seventh hour of me refining these ideas. But so this is a bit of a preview of, of all of that kind of stuff. Um, and there's a lot of more aspects of Metagram that I need to integrate in, into um, what I've already said about, you know, uh, the, these things. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, I must say, I'm sort of distracted by many other issues at, at the same time, sort of trying to get into politics and, and, and stuff like that. But anyway, um, 
so what what is there anything else for me to say so so this is what i see sam vaknan doing half the time i see him let's say being the standard bearer of the environmental Oedipal mother because if you lose that kind of cohesion i think um Look, I mean, these are actually quite big moral concepts that are hard to actually grapple with uh, as well to some degree. I mean, I think people that get very close to it, they can get burnt by it. I think um, Milo Yiannopoulos, for instance, um, you know, talks about the prestige intellectual economy. And I think that he's very close to this kind of, to the same kind of theme that, that I'm talking about. Um, here with this kind of Oedipal mother, this external narrative, and um, getting a, a, a moral discerning of these things and getting a grip of, of, of these issues is essentially the kind of, this is the moral corruption of our time, this is the source of delusion, and, and this is the kind of why we can't have a kind of why democratic literacy has been assaulted by, you know, these narrative um, yarn spinners. Uh, but that people want there to be something like an orthodoxy that has a built-in sort of priestly caste or a kind of built-in credibility into the system. And I mean, yes... I, look, there's a pragmatic aspect to that. Yes, we do need to have elites. Because if we don't have experts and elites um, debating in front of us, if we don't listen to the right discourse, we're not going to be able to be informed. But the idea that the information should come deliberated behind closed doors and already packaged to be consumed by the liberal democracy is essentially the debasement of liberal democracy. And um, I mean, that is not even to say, uh, that there's not even to talk about the distortion in COVID around, you know, well, we haven't had a real discussion around I ivermectin, nor have we even had, you know, proper research into it, I would say. You know, um, if you want to stop arguing about it, how about, you know, you, someone funds a real study for it. But, you know, this is how sort of corrupt the structure is. Um, that only big money, essentially, can pay for the right kind of study that uh, um, doesn't get shot at by the kind of the hard skepticism that any sort of trained and cerebral histrionic in a field that has been trained and tainted and twisted towards, you know, the kind of the intellectual apparatus that cerebral histrionics um, sort of uh, uh, grift, uh, up, you know, um, by, by the use of. so that they can make their sort of grandiose and grandstanding sort of moral usurpation, which is attached to a reality tunnel, which you, you know, and look, I understand that obviously, you know, like, you know, well, if you can have your own facts, then you can have kind of your own separate morality. And so it's important to, to have some kind of agreement on some kind of set of basic facts. But I think that the the problem is is not is that not that I'm saying that it's not possible. You see, this is how they get you because they say, well, you are actually conjecturing that that their facts are just are not certain. So we get to look at their set of possible facts, but we don't look at the general set of possible facts that we have to contend with their cherry picked set of possible facts and treat them as if they they should be certain because there are no other contentious components in the equation in the formula and we we're not allowed to see how the sausage is made as it were because if we did we would realize just how poorly substantiated uh, 
and and the poor rationale, the low quality rationale that has you know Glenn Greenwald perfectly goes into how the calculus of all of these policy debates is unreasonable, or he says unrational. Uh, he he calls it unrational. I I think it's unreasonable. It's incoherent and it's unrealistic. I I I and and I think that there are grounds of it being unrealistic which have not had a fair hearing in the court of public opinion that have not that have been strung up in and and applied the most kind of dishonest sort of intellectual rigor and it's under these conditions that I think people rightly cling to their conspiracy theories because you have sucked out all the trust from the room you have devalued basic reasoning and integrity you and you have substituted it with uh you know kind of lie sirens and loudspeakers and fear-mongering um and so i do think that this is a kind of dry run for a kind of authoritarian sort of thing just how far how, how far can you push the population just how sheepish are they And I and I, I do largely blame the culture, but um, you know, and I and I somewhat blame politicians for not being more robust over this. Although there are good examples of of politicians who have stuck their head out, and they have done the brave thing, and I think that they deserve to reap the rewards when when. Let's say the the fourth turning starts to show sort of the the chink in the armor which i mean hopefully look i i think that maybe in terms of cultural momentum see it's interesting because it's not just cultural momentum that matters it also matters reclaiming the institutions and we're very far from doing that or rectifying the institutions or cleansing them of of this kind of you know that you create these ambiguous, nebulous criteria so that then you can just use the interpretation of whoever authority figure you have standing in front of the microphone. And they are just kowtowing to whatever the consensus is that has been badly contrived in their field. And you don't listen to, 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 the, um, to the whistleblowers and you suppress the whistleblowers. And I think that there have been whistleblowers around Ivermectin, and they have, and and then, and then they get berated by the slew of you know sort of slurry, and besmirching, and you know the consensus in the field, and you know, and how and the real question is is how was all of the sausage made? But also, we never got to hear the actual substantiation of the policy in the first place, and there's a lack of humility and then there's just a kind of there's a bias in the collection of the data essentially that they get to say well we've got more cumulative data on our side well that's fucking irrelevant because the game was rigged the game was unprincipled from the get-go it's that's basically confirmation bias and in some sense it's all premised on a basic misalignment with reality to begin with that the idea that eradication is possible or that it's on the table, or that essentially that you have to have a lowest common denominator in, in, in health, that you have to have a one-size-fits-all prescription. And this is exactly why we have a terrible response to COVID, and it's exactly why identity politics doesn't work in, 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 in public policy. Oh, and uh, I should also mention, and I mean, I guess, you know, I, I don't know the study for this, if there is a study for this, but, uh, but, um, but I mean, I've also heard it from, from a medical, someone who had a medical degree saying this, that, um, that COVID has an animal reservoir. Uh, 
and that viruses with animal reservoirs essentially are, are not going to be eradicated anyway. So, I mean, unless we are testing each animal every week for COVID and or giving animals vaccines, it seems a, a complete... Um, sorry, I mean, I, I'm slightly broadening... Um, the, the topic of my address, I don't know if Sam Buckland goes into this, but I know it's, it's uh, been uttered in my country that people that choose not to have the, the vaccine should be compelled to be tested once a week, um, that they should you know, have to test themselves to make sure that they're safe and that they should also be isolated and ostracized or, or essentially um, kept away from other people uh, because uh, uh, of the danger that they pose, that they should have to, to to be severely restricted. So I think that probably does fall into something that Sam Buckland talks about. And um, you know, and, and this, uh, I mean. It, in that context, it really you should, really should open the door as to well, you know, what is the efficacious of ivermectin to use that in place of a vaccine? I mean, I would have no problem taking ivermectin. I think that that uh, uh, drug is largely safe. Um, and we certainly have been using it for long enough. Uh, To be relatively sure that that that, that it's safe enough. Uh, anyway, um, but I mean, if it is true that this thing has an animal, has an animal reservoir, then then really what? You know the the whole sort of idea that even if the vaccine did get into everyone's arm, and and even if it did, unless you can do this all over the world, I mean the whole thing is essentially is a house of cards, just waiting to blame somebody else for it its collapse. Essentially, I mean anyway, I'm repeating myself now. Let me just end this recording. But that's that's basically the thesis. Okay, so so just to re-emphasize my basic thesis is that the Oedipal mother uh, becomes a, a kind of mediator over a narrative, and so you know the Oedipal mother COVID has created a slew of categories and roles, and you know sort of. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and there's, a, uh, there's a right side and a wrong side of history, you know, um, of, of a kind of moral categorization to be labeled onto people, and people must accept that category system as being canonical. And this has been bolstered from his, cerebral histrionics from the outside, who have a reverence to this devouring mother, to this Oedipal mother mediator, called COVID-19, and that is how I see it operating as a kind of, as, as a psychological external narrative, as an external locus of control that is just objectively, you know, um, is, that, there, that, that there's an objective reality around it, never mind that, you know, it, 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 it can't be trespassed on by other people who have other ways of accounting for things or, or, or actually wanting a balanced substantiation of, of the thought process that led to this narrative outcome and that led to these prescriptions that have this narrative uh, uh, built into it. And so you've got this whole secondary economy of tone policing and suppression and, you know, bullying people based on essentially um, 
the ideological submission to the category system, to, to the narrative. And so the, the, the hidden premise never gets uh, properly evaluated. Um, and the, the objective nature of this external locus of control, of this external authority, which is seen to be an objective reality in the world, never gets, you know, c c can never be treated like it isn't a, uh, um, uh, you know, the, 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 that its reality is untouchable, it, it's sanctified. And the actual process of deriving this, this, you know, sort of sacrosanct blind faith never gets, um, is never made vulnerable uh, to real assessment, to, to actual substantive or principled, you know, sort of cost analysis, uh, cost benefit analysis, essentially. Um, and then, you know, you, and, and you get that kind of grandiose moral tone that is taken by these people where they say, no, 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 you have to accept this factoid as being certain because there's data for it, and you even by your own admission say that it's possible. So therefore, we have to proceed that that is not a, a mere possibility, but that must be the assumption. And so they've got a bank of sanctified assumptions that allow them to eventually scapegoat the blame for their failed policy and their failed program and their failed planning. So it's interesting how it all comes back to sort of the control over planning by paying a kind of lip service to a world view or, or a narrative. But okay, anyway, I really am repeating myself. But um, and, and you can understand why the narcissist has a kind of double edged or two faced relationship with this, because on the one end, it needs to feel superior to it, and it needs to kind of outshine it, it needs to abuse it as being in need of radical upgrading towards its standard because it is the luminary it is the you know the kind of the 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 i can't i can't do the proper german accent but wunderkind you know it's it's the kind of it's the prodigy whereas the cerebral histrionic t face and also needs to be played sometimes in order for there not to be a, because you can't just dissolve the prestige economy in a principled structure of, of, a, of an honest culture. You need to have some, some tokens of, of external locus of control, because otherwise you don't have a field from which to extract narcissistic supply. Because in some sense, the narcissist wants to be able to, it wants to have a consistent target to terrorize and to upgrade and to um, impose uh, revision onto and and feel superior to and and to dominate. It has it needs a thing to dominate, so that thing has to be a kind of prone to being. Um, devalued. But it also has to be of a kind of quality, of a kind of structure that it's capable of, of being um, uh, collectively addressed and targeted and uh, uh, collectively roped in to the polemic that, that the narcissist wants to um, leverage uh, for, for, for its prominent status, for its special luminary ability um, so it needs something to to see the reflection of its life in you know the extraction of narcissistic supply it needs the the mediator it needs a, a narrative that mediates roles and that says oh yes you have improved the system you are a luminary it's based in in the the group it's based in the objective narrative it's based in the external locus of control it's not based in individual versus individual versus individual interacting and communicating or refining uh, 
their thinking, it's based on a kind of a prominent token role that one has. And so there is a kind of that the narcissist is dependent largely on the Oedipal mother as, as the field of narcissistic supply, as the external locus of control. But it also has to, if it's not, if other people aren't going to, if other people aren't going to conserve the narrative, then they might also have to, as a secondary function from time to time, perform that function themselves. So as also to perhaps to make it more prominent when they are the um, uh, uh, abrasive, you know, to, 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 to kind of to elevate when they wish to to err on the more abrasive. Now, this is this is problematic because this motif that I've just described can also be incorrectly apportioned to people. Like, for example, just because people are doing this doesn't mean that there isn't some shred of coherent argument in what they say. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that could be salvaged or fact, you know. So this is a motif that or a formula that I'm pointing to, which is does not by itself preclude there to be merit in someone's, I mean, you know, someone can be right for the wrong reasons as well as is is another way of of putting it and and, so, and people can can be right but not know how right they are or in in what ways they are they are right and you know that is really in the eye of the evaluator in the eye of the beholder you know if you you know but at some point someone has to come up with a substantiated rationale that in which you can actually um you know at least have an honor for me it's about the fidelity of the process and so procedurally, these kinds of things are toxic. Um, and I'm mainly commenting on process and I'm commenting also on psychology. Uh, but anyway, so I, I think that that is at least insightful on, on, this as, uh, on, on these aspects. But uh, again, I think I've fully covered the, the topic and this really dovetails more with uh, my psychological um, research, which I going to upload very soon.